Okay, so for, for you, Scott, ultimately you wound up with an interest in electrical engineering and ultimately aviation. Mark, what piqued your interest in maritime engineering and transportation? Well, uh, the, we spent a lot of time on the New Jersey shore. My parents always had a boat from the time we were very little. We'd go out fishing. We'd, well, we'd go down there for usually for the summer. Not like the TV Jersey Shore. Yeah. So we'd go down there for the summer and spend a lot of time on the water. Uh, later, when we were teenagers, we were able to stay down there in the summer by ourselves on our parents' boat. You know, not a big boat like in the 35-foot range, but big enough for the two of us to live on. So I was just very interested in, you know, seamanship and maritime-related stuff. Uh, so probably when I was 13 or 14, I started looking at either going to the Merchant Marine Academy or the Naval Academy or the Coast Guard Academy. But the Merchant Marine Academy really got my interest. And for you, Scott? Well, plus our, you know, our grandfather was an officer in the U.S. Merchant Marine and a fireboat captain in New York City. So that was, uh, I think, also a, you know, a, played a small part in the interest in, you know, having a third mate's license, which I actually still have. I kind of kept it current all these years, and uh, never actually thinking I would uh, sail on the license. But the reason I went to the the school that I did was because it was a, um, you know, they had Navy ROTC there, and they also uh, it was a regimental type of environment. I thought it'd be better for me, give me more time to focus on schoolwork. And I was, uh, I was obviously right. Which one of you decided to become a pilot first? My recollection, it was me, but because he was a year uh, ahead of me in college, he actually was in the Navy first and flew first. But that's just my recollection. Yeah, I'm not sure. And did that influence you? to follow in his footsteps, basically? You know, I was pretty committed to the uh, Navy before he was because I was on a Navy scholarship in college. Yeah, it's true. I mean, I actually looked at uh, even going, hate to say this, but for a while I looked at going into the Air Force and uh, actually considered it, took the test, and they offered me, you know, an option of going to Air Force flight school. And, you know, but certainly I, I'm pretty convinced I took the you know, the right path there. Nothing against the Air Force people out there. but You were both uh, five years old when Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin set foot on the moon on Apollo 11. Uh, what recollection might you have of that at that age? And ultimately, was that a big influence on your developing an interest ultimately in aerospace or space, space flight itself? I don't think I have any recollection of Apollo 11 at all. I think at, at that age, I don't know what the situation was there, uh, but I don't remember the significance, and I don't remember, you know, man first walking, taking the first steps on the moon. I do remember what I'm pretty sure was either Apollo 16 or 17, one of the, one of the later flights a couple years later. And I was interested in it. Um, y y you know, it's one of those things when you're that age, you can be interested in something, but it just seems like it's so, you know, so far off and so difficult to do that you, you know, you don't really take a lot of time to consider it. And I, I do have a rec recollection of it. I can remember being in my, uh, you know, our living room and our parents, you know, sitting us in front of the television and um, having us watch it. And but as far as it, did that influence me, you know, certainly. Uh, being an astronaut was something that, that uh, like many kids, I was interested in, but, you know, I really never thought it would be a possibility. So with that in mind, uh, give us a little background on uh, how you were both selected to join the astronaut corps at the same time, which is unique in, in of itself, which parallels many other events in your lives together. Well, we both wound up in the same test pilot school class. We didn't apply at the same time. I was in graduate school in Monterey on this combined program, and um, which includes going to the Naval Test Pilot School, and then Scott applied to Test Pilot School. We actually wound up in the same class. The school didn't even realize it until I think a week before we showed up, and uh, Dick Clark, who now works here at NASA, was looking through the roster. He was the chief flight instructor at the time, 
and he noticed two guys with the same last name, which, you know, that's, that's kind of common, right? But then he noticed the Social Security numbers, and our Social Security numbers are three digits apart. And he, he was like, okay, well, these guys must be related, or actually, he, he realized we must be twin brothers. So after test pilot school, I'd say most test pilots apply at some point to, to the, the astronaut program, and we both did, and we're fortunate enough to be selected to the same class in 1996. So Scott, it took you only three years after your selection before you flew in space for the first time as the pilot on STS-103, Hubble Space Telescope servicing mission. And Mark, you didn't fly until a couple of years later uh, on your first flight, which went to the International Space Station. Was, was it frustrating for you, Mark, to see your brother fly first? Uh, were those competitive juices flowing at the time? Not at all. You know, he was the first American in our class to fly of 35. So it was great to, you know, if it wasn't going to be me, it was great that it was, it was Scott flying for the first time. And then I think it was probably two or three years later that I had the opportunity to fly on STS-108, so. What were your first impressions of space once you got on orbit, each one of you? Um, well, certainly when the solid rocket motors light, you know, for the first time, that gets your attention. I mean, there's nothing that, that prepares you for the amount of energy that's involved uh, with getting the space shuttle into space. It's, uh, you know, seven and a half million pounds of thrust all in an instant. You know, you get the impression you're going somewhere. You're really not sure where, but you're you're going there in a hurry and you're not coming back to Florida. I mean, it just, you know, kind of looks slow when you're watching it as a spectator, but when you're inside, there's nothing slow about it. I mean, it just really takes off. Um, you know, that's certainly may makes a significant uh, impact uh, significant impression and also you know just seeing the earth for the first time it's incredibly blue you know brilliant color blue and incredibly beautiful I have this very vivid recollection of about Mach 15 on my first flight looking over my right shoulder out the window and seeing this blue planet behind me and it's a view I've never had before you know it was the first time seeing something like that and it was really really impressive I even said something to, to Dom at the time, Dom Gorey, my the shuttle commander, that, you know, it was like, wow, that is really amazing. I, uh, you know, obviously we've had similar, like we've discussed, you know, similar backgrounds and experiences, you know, similar training as astronauts, and between the time I flew uh, my first flight and when Mark flew his, uh, I tried to explain to him, you know, what that first eight and a half minutes was going to be like, and, and after his flight when he landed, I was there in the, you know, the crew transport vehicle when the hatch opened and the crew came out. And the first thing he said to me when he, when he came out of the shuttle after his first flight was he said, he goes, I had no idea what that ascent was going to be like. Yeah, that's true. You know, you just try to describe it to other people that are getting ready to do this. And you know, I remember after the solids lit and the main engines looked okay and I had a few seconds, I looked over, you know, I started thinking, well, this just doesn't feel like I expected it to feel. You know, it's not as smooth as you expect. It kind of feels like you're on a runaway train going a thousand miles an hour. I remember looking over at Dom because I thought, well, this wasn't, this isn't quite right. And he, you know, he was okay with it. So, I'm like, well, this must be what it's supposed to feel like. Was how much of a wow moment was it for you, Scott, when you first uh, pulled up alongside uh, the Hubble Space Telescope, knowing? this icon of astronomy you were about to you and your crew were about to go service it upgrade it and for you mark to see the international space station at that time in its fledgling state but nonetheless pretty impressive what were your thoughts well you know just knowing you know what we've learned from hubble and how far back in time it can see um, you know it's uh, it's impressive for those reasons you know it's uh, it's about the size of a school bus, so as far as telescopes go, it's pretty big, but just understanding, you know, the impact it's made on our understanding of the origins of the universe is, you know, makes it a very uh, impressive sight. Now, compared to the space station, you know, the, you know, especially the last time I, well, when I saw it the, on my one flight, it's, uh, you know, Hubble's a lot smaller and, uh, you know, less visually impressive. 